Hello, my name is Bob. Welcome to a short stop on pool. This week's rack of the week was selected by my viewers. They voted on three consecutive racks from a 61 ball run I recently made. And the voting was very close between the three racks. The winner is number three, rack number three. Don't worry if you voted for rack number one or two. I'll feature those in a later rack of the week. But for this week, let's get into the rack. I've got an inside angle on the break ball, and it's a low ball that's far from the rack. I actually don't mind this shot, and that's because the break ball is about a half a diamond away from the rail. So I still have a pretty big target into the pocket. And the fact that it's so low means it doesn't feel like a blind pocket. I feel like I can see the pocket, and I can really zero in on the aim point, and I don't have any worries about hitting this ball hard. Now the tangent line looks like I'm going to miss the rack completely, but I'm going to hit this ball just a little bit above center. Not necessarily a far follow stroke, but I'm going to hit it a little above center, and it's going to catch that corner ball. Watch the break shot closely, and then we'll look at it again in slow motion. The cue ball is actually airborne all the way to the corner ball of the rack. It backs up off that corner ball and heads forward again, and it's airborne at that time as well. Now I think that's because I'm shooting off of the rail, so I'm actually striking down on the cue ball a little bit. When you hit it that hard, it makes it jump. This can happen even when the cue ball's out in the middle of the table and you're shooting above center on the cue ball. If your cue stick isn't perfectly level, that cue ball's gonna be in the air. The cue ball does have some top spin. It pushes into the rack again, and that's a pretty good result. Rack analysis on this one's pretty straightforward, I think, because I don't have a whole lot of options. I'm going to shoot the 12 ball. I think everyone's going to shoot the 12 ball here. What I see, though, is there's two sets of balls. There's the rack area balls and then the balls that are more in the open. I see two potential break shots, the 12 and the 4. I got to shoot the 12 now, so I only have one potential break shot in the 4 ball. The rack area balls aren't quite a pack. They're sort of loose but I don't see an easy way to maneuver around them and just pick them apart. What I do see is the six ball is ideal. If I could get a low angle on the six from either side, that would be a perfect way to open up those four balls in the rack area. But I don't see a real reliable way to do that. So I wanna leave those open balls alone for now and I wanna attack the clustered balls. So I have to shoot this 12 and the cue ball is gonna hit the one. So I just wanna do a soft draw, bring the cue ball back out to the center table, make sure I have a shot on either the 15 in the side or the two ball next. I'm really glad that the one ball cleared the 15 and didn't make a problem and it's an easy shot in the side pocket. So I have another insurance ball. I have just two shots to choose from here, the two ball or the 15 in the side. And I'm never going to shoot the 15 ball because I'm removing an insurance ball. The only way I would shoot the 15 is if it led directly to the next shot enabling me to open up that cluster. Now I could shoot the 15 and play position for the four to do that, but that's more of a re-break shot. It might be hard to control the cue ball. Although I do would have the one ball as an insurance ball on the side. But I'm also removing then the four ball as a potential break ball for later. So I'm really, 99% of the time, I'm shooting the two ball here. So I'm looking at what's going to happen to the cue ball. It's going to hit the five no matter what. So what can I do? I could hit the two ball softly with a lot of inside English and try and get that low angle on the six ball. That seems risky. The five ball could tie it up. I could also hit it a little bit harder with inside English and let the cue ball come back to center table and then evaluate my options from there. So those are three good options and I wouldn't fault any straight pool player for selecting one of those. What I see though is that the tangent line from the two ball sends the cue ball into the bottom part of the five. So if I hit this hard, the five ball should hit the six, open up that cluster, and with left English, the cue ball should pass around those balls back to center table. Now if any one of you want to call me crazy, you go right ahead. I'm willing to accept that label. When you're in stroke, it, it just feels good. It felt right. And with so many open balls up table, I felt like it was a very, very low risk shot as far as getting a shot on one of those up table balls. Now aside from that shot going nothing like I had planned, did anyone else notice what happened on this shot? Watch it again and watch the eight ball. My shirt moved the eight ball, and I did not notice that while I was shooting. I didn't even notice it during playback. I didn't notice it until a YouTube viewer pointed it out to me. Now, in the league that I play in, it's an amateur league, and the players often choose to play cue ball fouls only. 
And in that case, if my opponent saw it, we would move the eight ball back and I would continue shooting. But if you're striving to be an advanced player, you need to make a habit when you're practicing to not commit those kind of errors. That way it's a habit when you're in a competition as well. And that way this foul doesn't happen to you the way it did to Eklund Kachi in the last Moscone Cup. Make sure there's no clothing fouls. Foul! Foul! Now I don't know if Eklund Kachi fouled the ball here, but I certainly did. But let's assume it was in a league or a competition that was playing cue ball fouls only. If the six ball didn't lay up in front of the pocket, I would still have a shot on the 11, although difficult position. But that's the reason why I left the 11 ball there. An up table ball like that can be an insurance ball. I also might have a shot on the 10-15 combination in the side. Doesn't look too difficult. What can I say? There is luck in every pool game. But I had a plan and I took a risk with insurance balls on the table. And I was fortunate that a better shot worked out. This six ball is automatic. I just want to get a low angle on the five and go into that little cluster in the rack area. Here I have two options. I think a lot of straight pool players would want to hit the side of the 13 and the 7 and let the cue ball go to the left and stay in the open, knowing that, that you have the 1 and the 11 as insurance balls. Instead, I decide to hit the 13 ball full because I see the 7 moving to the left, the 13 carrying off the 7, sending the 14 up table, and then the 13 heading into the 9, possibly becoming a better break shot. And then I'm going to have the 9 ball and the 15 ball as insurance balls. And this time the balls went where I thought they would. You know, never look at those really small clusters as unpredictable. Just take a quick look at them. Those balls have to follow the laws of physics, and you can often make a really good estimate on where they're going to end up. So the next two shots are the 9 ball and the 10 in the side. I think most players would choose that. After I shoot the 9, though, I have an aha moment, and I want to talk about that. You know, they say that Willie Moscone would look at the 14 balls after a break shot, and figure out the pattern for the entire table. I don't know how often he could actually do that, but I think it's certainly true. You look at players like John Schmidt and Thorsten Homan, I know for a fact that they see longer patterns than you and I see. So I'm kind of proud of myself for seeing this one. Real quickly, it goes like this. The 13 ball is the break shot, the one ball is the key ball. The 14 and the four are neighbors to the break ball. I need to get them out of the way immediately. Usually you have more balls down table with which to maneuver to do that, but in this case I don't. The 15 ball is a key ball for the 14 in the lower left. Then the 14 is a key ball for the 4 ball. So I'm happy to be able to shoot 10, 15, 14, 4 and get rid of the, all the trouble balls surrounding the break ball. At the same time that I see that, I see that the 7 is a good K2 ball for the 1 ball because it's diagonally across the table. The 8 is a K3 ball for the 7 and the 11 is a K4 ball for the 8. Each of those balls is diagonally across the table from the other. And my position zone to enter the end pattern, the 11 ball, is as big as the state of Texas. Texas. Let's see if this end pattern is as foolproof as I think it is. I'll speed this up while we wait for someone to get out of the way. My position is a little short on the eight ball, but the nice thing is, because of the relationship of the K3 to K2 ball, all I have to do is make the eight ball go back and forth and I'm perfect on the seven. This is perfect and with the one ball so close to the side pocket, I have a real big margin of error, but you still wanna think about that margin of error. And this is similar to a shot we looked at last week. If you look at the shot line for the one ball into the side pocket, I don't want to get too low, I don't want to get too high. Uh, I choose to stun the cue ball over. I could have followed to the side rail and gotten in that window for that position zone as well. 
So I ended up on the very short side of that position zone, but uh, it's real easy to go to the rail, a lot of inside English, hold the cue ball for a nice inside angle on this break shot. I have to say, I think this break shot might become my new favorite. You can stroke it with just a straight high ball with a lot of force. It's going to open the rack well and keep that cue ball under control. That said, I was a bit unfortunate. I really don't have a great shot. My only shot is this seven ball in the upper left. Now, if you're playing a game of nine ball, that's a hanger. When you're playing straight pool, boy, you want an easy second shot. And so this is just a smooth follow stroke, two rails out of that corner. I know I'm going to have an angle then on the eight ball to come back down table. Thank you for watching and I hope you found that informative and helpful. If you did, please hit the like button and consider subscribing. Check out my book, A Short Stop on Straight Pool. You can find it at shortstoponpool.com and stay tuned for next week's Rack of the Week.